Name, host name is nothing but a human readable name assigned to a computer or a device. Uh, basically, it is helping us to communicate with the device without needing to remember complex IP addresses. Okay, so if you are on IPv4, still you can say that you can remember a IPv4 address, but once you will go to IPv6, it is practically impossible to remember it. So how do you connect with your machine and say if Dheeraj Aman are working in the same office uh, and they have to exchange some information between the devices? Either they have to remember the IP address of each or they can actually set the host name of their machines as Dheeraj and Aman and do the basic configurations that are required and they can reach either each other's machine using Dheeraj and Aman, right? So that is why host names came up. A few good examples of host names can be text of 1234AB. This is normally auto generated. Uh, support PC, uh, custom name for support team system and filter HR, right? So if you will go to your system and uh, Say if you want to know the host system, so how do you, you can simply go on uh, your your uh, even you can you can go to this PC. Uh, this will actually open this thing, and from here we can go to system properties. So a system property window will open. Yeah, so this is here, and this is my name, right? This is you can see. I can click on this button and rename my PC also. So that will be the new host name for my PC. Uh, FQDN, this is called fully qualified domain name. So basically, whenever you host a service on internet, uh, the concept here is of domain name. So you actually have to go to domain name service providers like GoDaddy, et cetera. So you actually uh, purchase a domain name from them. And, uh, and when you, uh, you give a machine your host name. So if you combine your host name and domain name, it becomes fully qualified domain name. On internet, what we do is we map this fully qualified domain name to public IP addresses. So uh, when you procure a server and you want to host that server as website, so there are two, three steps required. So first of all, you procure a domain name. Uh, then you actually uh, procure a public IP, right? So if you are hosting your services on, say, websites like Hostinger, so they will provide you a public IP, right? And then you go to this name server management or DNS management tool of your uh, DNS provider, and there you will map your FQDN with your IP address, okay? Uh, so normally even domain name mapping with the IP address works, and that is how your websites work. So on internet, every F FQDN, if you want to reach a server by the name or the domain name or the FQDN, you have to do the DNS mapping. So a typical example can be the name can be CRM server, domain can be learning.com. So CRM server.learning.com will become the FQDN. And we can actually map an IP address with this with, with this FQDN. Okay. I hope this is clear. Yes. Okay. So DNS we had discussed, so not, not discussing again. Again, you can refer to this particular thing. So whenever you are doing a DNS query, uh, so there are two, three uh, name servers. So these are called name servers, which maintain the mapping of DNS to your IP addresses. You can even call them DNS servers, but a good name is name server. So whenever you request your DNS server for resolving a public uh, domain, so first of all, your requests go to the root server, root name server, right? So root name server will be what? Like dot. Dot is normally referred to as root name server. So this particular dot in dot com, right? So this server will have the mapping of all the high level, top level domains. So this dot com is known as top level domain. So dot com, dot org, dot in, and so on. So the root name server will first of all return the IP address of the top level domain server, TLD name server. In the TLD name server, so it will reach the .com TLD name server. So .com TLD name server, .n TLD name server, .org TLD name server will all be different. So the .com TLD name server will have the mapping for Google.com. So this request will then go to Google.com, uh, this authoritative name server. So basically, it will tell you tell it that where does the Google.com mapping you can find 
so this authoritative name server will be the place where it will be able to find the google.com mapping and then maybe there is one more server also for the complete fqdn it is possible finally the dns server will know the ip address of www.google.com or example.com and this ip address will be then returned to your machine and your machine will start uh, you know using this ip address for communication this particular thing is not very critical to remember not many people will ask you but this is more for your knowledge dscp we have discussed uh, so uh, important thing for dscp is that all these things you get from the dscp server your ip address subnet mask default gateway dns server ip lease time and so on these are the dora messages that we have discussed uh, this we have also discussed earlier that assigning an IP address automatically. So basically on your Windows machine, you can go to network and internet settings, click on your connection, click on properties and select the IPv4 properties and assign your manually IP address. So normally this you will do not in your home. Uh, unless your network supports it, you will not do it. Otherwise you can lose the internet, but you can try if you have the administrator login of your system. Okay. Now we discuss about the ping, NS, lookup, tracer, and netstat, right? So these are the four main commands that we use. So I will just showcase these to you once. So this is typically the ping command, right? We will learn more these commands when we are doing network fundamentals, but this is a typical case. So I can give ping. In Windows, when you don't give this minus T flag, by default, you only end up sending four ping requests, right? So this is a typical way how you ping. Uh, it returns with the IP address and then it says that your number of bytes are these time to live is this and TTL is 90. So I will later on give you a link to do this uh, to see more about ping and understand it. So another command that you can always run is tracer if it is available. Yeah, tracer command is there. So I will give minus four so that IPv4 resolution happens and I can give this right. So tracer command basically goes to all the hops. So hops basically is the routers in between. Routers are devices that route your packets to a different location or a destination. So each router is known as a hop. And this will tell you the status of our hop, right? So what is the response from this? How is the response from this? So you can see that the maximum delay is happening at this particular hop, OK? So this is how you can see hop by hop. Then we have got one command also called NS lookup, which is now replaced by a dict command actually. So this should be here, but right. So basically, if I want to see NS lookup of google.com, so it will tell me that what is their IP address, where this particular server is hosted. And um, doesn't serve much with us, but it is mostly more, more apt when we are trying to make something public and uh, there are some issues coming there. Otherwise, you can even do this thing using a ping command. Another very important command is called netset command. Netset command allows you to see all the all the connections on your system, right? So you can see that how your system is connected to different different places. You can see that it is trying to showcase that uh, this is these are the established connections. These are the listening connections. So basically, port level information of your system you will get here. Uh, we will discuss more about it in our networking fundamentals topics. But uh, yeah, for now, this is it. Now, a few things to understand.